excited and highly anticipated review of Bioshock Infinite, which will finish our three-week series on the series. Yeah, and I, I again, I've got to say, I know I've said this before, I really appreciate these retrospectives. We uh, went through the Uncharted trilogy, now we're going through the Bioshock trilogy, and it's been fun to play along with you. Uh, we both beat uh, Bioshock Infinite fairly recently. Yep. <clears throat> um, so, you know, it's it's been... It's been fun. Uh, I wish I had played the second one, and I'm not quite sure when I'll get to it, but I do intend to buy it at the next available opportunity. I think it is, in fact, a very interesting way to actually experience a series, especially one that is extended across a generation, because you not only get to enjoy uh, playing the three games directly in a row for the sake of the narrative or for the sake of the continuity of the company, but you also get to see how games have evolved over the generation as well. Right. Now, before we get into the review, um, first, of course, we've got to get JG4XChamp, a.k.a. Ryan, of the Goofu Yourself podcast, also known as DeBroCast. That's right. I have actually listened to some of your podcasts, as you can tell from both those statements. And his prediction was a seven. Um... Would you like to offer your prediction now or afterwards? I believe... What did you give Bioshock, the original? I gave it a 7. Okay. And the second? I gave it a 6.5. Then... Wow, that's that's kind of a curveball. Um, I think you're going to give this game a 5.5. Okay. Duly noted. Yep, duly noted. And I just wanted to thank uh, Richard... For Bioshock Infinite, as he bought it for me, and apologize right. to Arnie for forgetting to give him the same credit for Hotline Miami. Oh, right on, man. Thank you, Dick, and thanks, Arnie. Yep, exactly. Um, that is, in fact, what he likes to be called, by the way, so you got his name correct. Yep. Yep. Now, just a couple of other things uh, before I do get into the review. This is possibly the only time that DRM has come in useful. So Bioshock Infinite uses Steam as its DRM, which means that... I think you've experienced this with Tomb Raider. So basically what it means is you put the disc bullshit. in. Yep, yeah. yep. You put the yeah, disc bullshit. in. Bullshit. You start installing, and then it starts downloading the fucking game. Yeah. Which is the stupidest, worst oh. system you could possibly come up with. Right? Yeah. In the world, man, because, like, for me, you know, I get 15 gigabyte a month, right? Yeah. So you buy a physical game, you bring it home, you install it, you don't expect to be any overhead. Exactly. But then it's like, oh, no, it's a Steam game. And guess what? You can't play it on Steam unless you update it. Yeah. So you have to update it, and then you lose, like, half of your monthly, you know. Allowance. And, yeah. But you can. there are ways around it with games that do do this. So you can still install from disk. And then it just checks it uh, online. So you can get around it, but it is utterly stupid. But the one advantage that this has is what that means is that it adds the game to your Steam account. So that means you can then download it at a later date, um, however you please. So for me, the disc, for some reason, did not work on my gaming PC. So What do you, what do you mean it didn't work? I like put you the put disc it in, in. It, didn't, yeah. it didn't run. I have no idea why. Every you other disc I tested worked fine. Couldn't see it in Explorer. It was just blank, just as it huh. is normally. But it did work on my laptop, which has absolutely no hope of running Bioshock Infinite. But all I needed to do was, hey, enter the CD code on there, and voila, I could then download it, which is the only time I can ever think the DRM has possibly come in practically handy for anyone so, in so, the industry. So the CD, didn't, the CD didn't acknowledge it uh, your main computer did not acknowledge it as being a readable CD. Correct. But your laptop did. Yeah. Different operating systems? No, both Windows 7. Wow. So actually, actually, uh, the laptop would be 32-bit, so that might oh, okay. have been why. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, a win in your case. Correct. And Somewhat. Yeah, vaguely. A win because the product itself or my drive was working properly. Wait, where'd you get this? Because you get most of your games digitally. So you had a physical copy in this case? Yep. Um, I think Richard bought it from uh, WoW HD, probably. Oh, okay. Yep. Right on. And 
Speaking of uh, DRM, just take in a different direction. And we do need to do this because DRM is a common theme with Bioshock games. We had the secure on disaster of the first one when it was first released. Oh. What did they do with 2? Can you guess? No. Well, apart from including Secure ROM, they also made it games for Windows Live. So not only do you have to put up with Secure ROM, you had to put up with possibly the worst interface ever known to man. It took me about 40 minutes to get the game running at all in any conceivable fashion. And... It was then full of glitches, which... This is so horrible. You should be able to buy a piece of software and install it on your computer without having to interact with the internet and everything else. I mean, if you can't come up with... I mean, you know what was better, DRM? Yeah. An instruction manual. With which said periodic, Yeah, pre, and periodically it would say, turn to page 46 and give us the third word in the second paragraph. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is bullshit. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you have to you buy a physical thing but you can't use it, it ah. is ridiculous. And wait, though, it gets even better. Okay, so we know the interface of games for Windows Live is utter shit. Um, it goes even further than you have to log into this stuff uh, to be able to play online. Guess what else it functions as? It functions as the device that saves the game. So your games are at the mercy of games for Windows Live, meaning to access your saves, you need to use that account. And also, when Microsoft decides that they're no longer going to, you know, dip their toes into this, you know, form of gaming, where does that leave you when you buy this guy game, you know, seven years from now? Exactly. But you can't, um, <clears throat> let alone the saves, you cannot play the game without registering it on Games for Windows Live, and that version of the game is then tied to your account on top of that. So yeah. it's just pretty damn ridiculous. And It's so stupid because the thing is this, they have the love of many gamers through their 360 console. Yeah. You know, um, translate that over to the PC side. You know, if you buy a game for PC, let it be playable on the 360. If you buy a game on the 360, let it be playable on the PC. Even if you do have to download a, a ridiculously sized file. Yeah. Have that unified login, have the unified achievements, and do something with this. I mean, they're a massive company with huge profits. They should be able to make this work. It's not like they're Square Enix. I mean, imagine if Square Enix owned like 95% of all desktop operating systems, <laughs> right? I mean, you'd think they'd do a better job of it. And even though they're a Japanese company that has no understanding of how Western people work, and here is Microsoft just absolutely squandering the the Western games uh, uh, format on the PC. Absolutely. There's nothing that Microsoft could have done that would have been more onerous than what Steam did. And yet Steam has made it work. Um, well, there was so, one thing that it could have done that could be more onerous than what Steam did, and that is games for Windows Live. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So the final, final thing before we move on, I just wanted to say, um, in Bioshock 2, look up the Little Sister theme song. Now, sorry, Big Sister theme song. Imagine that looped over an entire level. Now we can finally move on to Infinite. And I want to begin with something that we've basically got obsessed with on uh, the Bioshock games, and that is the look of the enemies. So in Bioshock, they're these tin toying, style characters, and in Bioshock 2, they're just your generic garden variety, horror-style enemies and clay people, right? Right. Now, in Infinite, I think the characters can best be described as Japanese anime-style sex dolls. Right. I mean, they're very uh, robotic. I mean, uh, all the enemies in this game have been golems, but in this game, they take the non-playable characters and extend these same traits to them as well. Yeah. Um, on our website, I have a uh, shot of them uh, basically synchronized cleaning. I mean, there's no <laughs> other way to, dis to, to describe it. They have people, for no explained reason, um, moving in absolute synchronization, cleaning, you know, video game arcades and floors and things like that um, in a very robotic style. Yeah. 
Uh, in Bioshock 1, at least, I know that the non-playable characters acted in a somewhat organic manner in that they ran toward you. Um, but in this game, uh, there are peaceful non-playable characters <clears throat> who uh, don't seem very human. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It, it's, I mean, the bizarre thing about the look of the character, just go back look for a second, is the giant eyes. So the general look that they were going for, as far as I can see, is to have the characters look like dolls crossed with um, old turn-of-the-century religious iconography, which you see yep. as a motif repeated constantly. But then they've got these giant fucking eyes, which makes no sense and makes the characters... I mean, maybe they were meant to look like um, button, button eyes on a doll or bobble eyes, do you think? Yeah, I mean, in a lot of uh, religious, particularly Catholic iconography, they do have overly large eyes as well. Um, but the bizarre but thing I... about that is, with their imitation of the religious iconography in the paintings, in the games, that's not a trait that they generally copy. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, other than in the main character of um, Elizabeth, yeah. uh, who has these ridiculous Disney, you know, doish eyes. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps we should cut to the chase here in terms of the actual game itself. Well, I don't think we should. I don't think we should. And Well, let, let's linger longer then on exactly, the aesthetic of the game. Exactly. And with Elizabeth, she's the, char- the only character that was really consistent with the religious motifs in the game. And the reason for that was not so much her eyes, but her general face and features were much more um, dynamic in look and movement. So her expressions were much softer and more morphing and more easily changeable and a lot whiter in colour as well compared to most of the characters and rounder. And her eyes, while they were larger than the other characters' eyes, they were less square, which is another bizarre thing of the characters' eyes. So to me, she was the only character that was consistent with the religious motif. So I I can't help but assume that the rest of the characters were meant to come across completely as dolls or something. And she was, of course, the only character in the game um, that was more of a story character. For example, DeWitt, his depiction was similar to the characters you you come across just as random characters in the game where they're completely undynamic and they're depicted as like a carnival attraction that you come across and you look at and you don't interact with, but you observe as a um, interesting thing in the world that is has no relation to being human, right? Well, I thought that uh, Elizabeth was the only character in this game. Um, because it's a first-person shooter, you really don't ever see Booker DeWitt. Yeah, sorry, um, when I meant De- DeWitt, I meant Comstock. Okay, and and then all the other enemies in the game, because everyone else you see in this game is either an enemy or an NPC, acted in a robotic uh, manner. Um, So, I mean, she really is the only character in the game. Um, And and several people said, well, you know, this game would have been better, and I'm one of them, uh, had it taken uh, the third world, uh, not the third world, the third person view. Yep. Um, if if we'd seen Booker DeWitt in in the form of a you know uh, Nathan Drake, I think this game would have been much better because when you're in the first person, obviously you're supposed to interpret your actions as the main character. Yep. But but in such a fanciful setting, um, you really oh fanciful setting, uh, you really can't relate to it in any way, and so you you don't feel like you're participating as a person. So it would have been better, perhaps, to have a third-person, you know, view where you have an actual character, uh, because Booker DeWitt as a character really doesn't have any grist. It really doesn't grip at all. You really and the don't reason, care. I think that changing the perspective wouldn't have helped with that, because to me, the reason for that is another bizarre thing that they did in Bioshock. And just the final thing on on the Elizabeth thing. Do you think that the reason for doing that with the doll design of the characters um, and the completely um, impersonal design of them was simply to contrast with Elizabeth. No, I don't. I, I 
I don't know what's going on with this game. I would love to know what is going on <laughs> with this game, but I don't think it's that deep. I mean, there are some things in this game that are so deep. Yep. But so so you're saying that they're going to make all the other visual characters in the game robotic as to make Elizabeth more human. That's the theory um, I'm asking if you think that's the case. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. I'll give you that. It's plausible. Well, yeah. Because because there is very little reason for the rest of the game to be as poor as it is in terms of its depiction of other characters. The depiction of other characters is so poor. Um, the characters are depicted as robotic, dispensable, you know, in, in every other way. So if we're supposed to be focusing our attention on Elizabeth, then yeah, that is plausible. Yeah, and I think, I, I'm not sure if that contrast uh, was necessarily deliberate because I didn't find that they did the same thing with the religious motifs, with the contrast, with contrasting the religious motifs, which she was basically exactly the same as with other visual styles. So I was just positing that as a theory. I wouldn't agree with it either. But I do think that the characters were perhaps deliberately um, depicted in the way they were for the feel of the setting, which is very much playing on World's Fair style exhibitions where, and even museum exhibits where you come across automated um, people, like you might come across someone, a pioneer cutting up a log, right? Yeah, the, the, the whole animatronic thing. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was drawing on that a great deal. But back to what you were saying about DeWitt, I think the major failing with DeWitt is the same thing that they did with Bioshock. Now, there were actually two other characters than Elizabeth in the game, and I do in- not including DeWitt. And those two other characters were, of course, the twins, if you remember them. And if you look at the plot and the way it unfolds, it's exactly the same as in Bioshock. In Bioshock, you've got Tenenbaum, and the conflict in Bioshock is not got anything to do with Andrew Ryan or the protagonist, but is about Tenenbaum trying to redeem herself for the Little Sisters, right? That is the yep. core conflict in Bioshock Infinite, and we'll get into it in more detail later on where we get into some spoilers. The conflict is actually, once again, about the twins' redemption in regards to something they did to the characters involved. It's, and it's done in the same bizarre way of how they did in Bioshock, where they, these characters that are completely removed from the game in basically every tangible way and yet they're centered around that's what the whole plot is centered around and the failing is that unlike in bioshock where it was left to the side and they didn't attempt to replace it with um attempting to push to the fore at the andrew ryan or the main character bullshit here they do attempt to push to the fore the dewitt story and the elizabeth story which then takes away uh, first of all then fails because the conflict has nothing to do with them, at least not nothing to do with the protagonist of the game, so you're already missing something to hook you into the story. And it also then takes away from what is a bizarre way to tell a story because it then makes it seem completely bizarre, whereas in, because in Bioshock you didn't have anything to contrast it to, you could accept it for what it is. Here it just comes across as being bizarre and jarring, right? Yeah, I, it does. We're not yet in spoiler territory, right? Correct. So we'll go into that into more depth later on. And just the final few things on this is I thought it was a much less well-realized aesthetic than Bioshock. Um, and the reason for that is two things. The first is, to some degree, not their fault. Now, Bioshock was apparently just, was apparently inspired by The Devil in the City, which is a novel by Eric Larson, which you have been reading a little bit of, but I don't think a great deal. No, I, I've read through the first few chapters, and basically it's about the Chicago World Fair in the late 1800s. Yep. And this is said to, uh, by Ken Levine himself, have inspired uh, many of the things in this game, and I can I can see that. Um, essentially, the book is about the Chicago World Fair, and um, there's lots of white people with plenty of money, looking toward the future and, oh, my God, how wonderful is this going to be? And yet underneath all of this, there's a serial killer who is, you know, killing a bunch of people in Chicago. Yeah. 
um, who turns out to be a doctor, but th- that that's neither here nor there. So basically, there's this, you know, bright new future, late 1800 setting, but underneath it, there is something that's more disturbing and troubling, uh, that is, you know, threatening to undermine it all. And I, yeah. you know, uh, and the mayor of Chicago at that time, his last name was Dewitt. So obviously, Ken Levine took some, you know, inspiration from this. Uh, in, in literal and thematic ways. Yeah, well, I, I'm getting more along the thematic um, type of stuff, and I only read the very first section, so this could be completely wrong, but the first section came across to me as being the extreme case of mainstream literature, which is to say uh, mainstream literature is a style of writing which is basically a faux literary style, which means that what you're doing is you're writing something that is technically in some ways complex, but is technically completely and utterly meaningless and unrelated to what you are depicting. So that to me has drastically influenced the aesthetic of Infinite because what you get from something like The Devil in the White City is completely unrelated beyond the factual information to the period that it is depicting. So you might it might be an excellent history book, but it's going to have none of the feeling or conventions of the period that it's depicting. And to me, Infinite is that to a T. It's copying this sort of fake um, depiction of an aesthetic where they illustrate it through um, referencing and information as opposed to aesthetic. Well, it, it's fluff based on fluff. Absolutely. Is the, That's is, what I'm is saying. Is the problem. Yeah. yeah. And so, well, I don't think the aesthetic is as anywhere near as good as in Bioshock. To a degree, that is because they're copying fluff, as you said. But even then, there are some really ridiculous flaws in the aesthetic that were not there in Bioshock. And the most utterly ridiculous and stupid thing that I came across is in a police station, there is a um, black ball, white ball, whatever you want to call it, where they've got these suspect, suspect pictures stuck up. And on the board is a comic book style character that you might see in The Walking Dead in a game set in 19 fucking 12. What the fuck is that doing in there? And it might seem like a minor thing, but I cannot remember anything absolutely fucking ridiculous as that in Bioshock. That would be like including um, a modern jazz song in place of a ragtime song in Bioshock 1. It is that fucking ridiculous and obvious and you wonder how the hell did that get past quality assurance, right? Well, my question is in terms of uh, the juxtaposition of inappropriate things. Yep. In previews for this game, early previews for this game, they had um, a section where you moved into 1980s America. Yeah. And it, it had a, instead of Return of the Jedi, it was something else of the Jedi, and th- that was George Lucas's original name for Return of the Jedi, like Revenge of the Jedi, yeah. actually, I think. And I th- I never encountered that in the game. Is that in the game anywhere? Yeah, that, that's in the game all over the place. You come across constant little snippets of um, music from a later time period, various things from later time periods, but it's always very obvious what that they foreshadow it and either explicitly state that this is something from another time period or it is blatantly foreshadowed. There is There are no subtle moments that are from other time periods. And all the subtle stuff is where they're trying to build the aesthetic of it being from 1912. But there are definitely moments of stuff from a later period, and maybe this was something where they had, okay, let's include some comic book characters, and they missed removing it. Because there's no way that this was deliberate, despite them including stuff from later time periods, because of the consistency elsewhere. And there's just a couple of other moments where they do have um, failures in consistency as well. But Little things like that make it a drastically less um, well-realised aesthetic than Bioshock. And another thing, and this is entirely the fault of the inspiration, 
But another thing that I found hugely disappointing was the lack of their use of convention from the time period. The only, the only area where they took anything from the period was the little knee stuff where you've got a character um, claiming uh, to have done stuff at Little Knee and wanting recognition for it and also possibly another character not claiming to do it. That's a little late for that sort of thing that you generally look at as being from the late 1800s or closer to the American Civil War, but that's at least closer to something from the time period, right? And I can't think of another thing that really bought into the time period at all, which was incredibly disappointing to me. But you have to blame the inspiration, so you can't blame them so much for that. Well, the fact that you have such a strong response to it at least, I mean, indicates that the uh, the creators, you know, got across the point they were trying to make, whether or not you agree or disagree with it. Yeah, well, apart from the few minor um, inconsistency that are there and around, aesthetically, it is. I would, I still would say it is an extremely well realized aesthetic, but there are some major a minor inconsistencies here and there. The one failing in the aesthetic, which has got nothing to do with what they're copying, is in the writing and the acting. Now, Susan O'Connor is no longer involved. They're brought in someone else. Um, I can't remember their name. But it's a new writer that had nothing to do with Bioshock 1 or 2. And I'm sorry, the writing is shit. There's no two ways about it. The vast majority of it is generic bullshit script writing that you can find in any fucking game that is not even particularly well done. And the reason for that is this writer is probably perfectly capable of writing a video game script. They're not capable whatsoever of writing a script that goes beyond that. And that's because very often they try to include little snippets of 1912 grammatical construction and speech, and they fucking fail. They never get it right. And the worst thing is that they just stick it in every little bit here and there with no rhyme or reason. And it takes away from the script, not just because it's a change in style, but because it ruins the emotion of certain important emotional sequences where they suddenly stick in some stupid grammatical construction from 1912 that they're fucked up which then ruins the emotion in the writing. And the actors fucking struggle with it so badly. Whenever they come up with some 1912 speech, then they've, got, they've then got to completely alter the way they deliver the lines. And it eats into their performances so poor, so badly. And at this stage, as far as I could tell from the mocap credits, this was, and also the structure of the game, this was a voice actor title, not a motion capture actor title. And at this stage, after Uncharted, and even stuff like Killzone is doing it, I don't think you can do a voice actor game anymore unless you have the best writers in the medium writing the script. Because it is going to result in a performance that is incomparably worse than something like Uncharted. And because so many games are now doing it, not just Uncharted, it stands out as being really poor, to me anyway. It's basically the emphasis from the person who writes the dialogue and the person who delivers the dialogue. Um, and in performance capture, you know, that's all, the, the person who performs it is always going to have the edge. Uh, they're going to have the ability to improvise um, which is going to have a greater value than, you know, dialogue read from a written page. Well, the reason they're going to have the advantage is not necessarily because the medium is going to result into a superior vocal performance, but because the standard of actors that are picked for voice acting in video games, first of all, most of them are, in fact, television and theatre actors. Nolan North has done work in television, etc., etc. He's a better visual actor than he is an audio actor. So if you get to film him doing a performance, his vocals are going to be superior to if you're just filming him because of the type of actor he is. And to me, you're generally going to get a better performance out of um, Western performances if you do it in that manner. Because of 
the economics involved and the people involved. I think you can easily get you can get a superior vocal performance out of voice acting, but in video gaming, I don't think you can because of the people involved. And it, it's very obvious to me, at least. You compare the vocal performances in this game to something like um, Uncharted. There's a world of difference, right? I'm not imagining this. No, you're not. I mean, again, even the characters of Elizabeth and Booker DeWitt uh, and the way they interact when you compare them to The Last of Us or Uncharted uh, or Enslaved or any other game that employs performance capture, um, it seems very staged, very vaudevillian, um, very two-dimensional. Yeah. And the other reason, of course... To pull off good voice acting as well, you need good writing, and you're very rarely going to get that. And you can't blame the writing only for this performance. Elizabeth is putting one of the worst vocal performances in games for me in recent memory. And the reason for that is, what the fuck were they thinking when they decided to have her act as a teenager, a modern-day teenager, or some... Valley Girl from a reality TV show. The only difference between her performance and the way those people sound is the vigorous use of like and but. Yeah, the the character is to blame here. I mean, uh, the character is not in any way a real person. Um, and, and the writing of that character really handicapped the actress, I believe. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I... I agree, but on top of that, I think it takes a special amount, and it could be the direction, of course, as well, but it's pretty damn hard to be thinking you're playing a character in 1912, even if it's based on the devil, whatever the fuck that book is called, even if it's based on that, it takes a rather large leap to come up with modern-day teenager who sounds like they're from a reality television show. I don't think you can just blame the depth of the character for that. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it probably does come down to direction because she was told to play a uh, you know a young female character who is extremely naive yeah. in her teens, and so a modern actress is going to interpret that as she will. Now, I think we've probably talked enough about the aesthetic now. Um, and let's move on to the gameplay, which I think personally was a huge improvement from the original Bioshock. We'll leave aside the second for a moment, as this is the second Ken Levine game in the series. Um, The major reason for the improvement is twofold, and basically related to the major failings of the original Bioshock, and that is that the plasmids in the original Bioshock were all exactly the same beyond maybe three different styles, and the weapons were all exactly the same, there weren't even three different styles. Once upgraded, they were all exactly 100% the same. In Bioshock Infinite, there are still certain conventions in the plasmids, but there's more variety. So there's now, um, you've got the grenade plasmid, which is literally a grenade. Then you've got the plasmid, which slows an enemy down and sticks them in place, which was in the previous Bioshock, was in the original Bioshock, the lightning and um, the fire and the ice. And you've also then got the shield plasmid, which, once again, alters how you play. If you're using the shield plasmid, you can then play more defensively. um, And then there's charge, which means you can then play extremely aggressively because not only does it instantly get you over to the enemies, it also recharges your shield at the same time. So... They're just two extra plasmids that drastically alter the gameplay and make it much more varied and much more in line with what they were attempting to achieve with the original Bioshock. And then you also include the Skyhooks, which don't add a huge... They're basically the same as the charged plasmid, except that they mean you can move around the larger environments um, more easily, which adds a slight dimension to the gameplay because the larger environments then allow the level design to have multiple different um, concentrations of enemies that you can move between. 
which results in a drastically more dynamic combat system, which actually works, I thought, very well when you combine that with the weapons, which actually have some differences between them with their use. And that's within the context of the Bioshock series. They're still not drastically different from one another. And for some bizarre reason, they decided to include multiple versions of weapons within the same weapon type. So there's like five different submachine guns, which is just utter needless stupidity. Now, Yeah, I, I couldn't really see a difference between one or the other. Including within the original type. So you could use the shotgun from the same difference that you could the, use the machine gun? Right, yeah. You could? Okay. Well, I didn't really I mean, find that. I mean, to some degree. I mean, w- what I mean is within the different classes of the submachine gun, I didn't really see that much of a difference. No, in, the, in the different subclasses, there's no difference whatsoever. Right. And I, I don't see why they were included. They should not have been there. But if you were using a submachine gun compared to the shotgun, I couldn't use them from the same distance at all. But Oh, yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. Which is a huge difference compared to the original where you could use the shotgun as a long-range weapon with... No right. problems whatsoever. And so, to me, that's a humongous improvement over the original. And I'm going to say it's it's a slight improvement over the second because the environments are larger. And also, because um, another thing they did differently is they included a larger amount of tougher enemies. And it still becomes the same issue that you faced in the original where fighting the larger enemies becomes boring and predictable because there's now several as opposed to one in the original and two in Bioshock 2 even though none of the enemies in Infinite are as good as the big sisters for the, for your average combat as you're just going through the game it results in the combat being more enjoyable even though it doesn't reach any particular great height it makes every battle become more engaging um, than in both one and two, because there is more variety to the individual battles, which is still not to say that it's amazing, but I, I think what it does do is it takes what are very generic, but now un- as opposed to into um, solid first-person shooter mechanics with not only the weapons, but there's a reasonable weight to the movement and flow to the movement. Combine that with what is now finally reasonably well done, interesting gimmick, which is the plasmas and the skyhooks, which finally has achieved what they were setting out to do in the original Bioshock. And it takes what would have otherwise been a very uh, mediocre at best and generic first-person shooter and makes it interesting. This is all, of course, offset by the extreme amount of backtracking that is in the game. You move through every single area, or almost every single area, at least twice from the very beginning of the level to the very end, with very little difference between when you were first there and when you went back through, right? Which is takes away a lot of the good work that they've done in the combat, which to me was a huge improvement, and deserves a lot of kudos for finally achieving everything that they've been attempting to, but it is really offset by the extreme amount of backtracking. Yeah, I didn't find the backtracking to be that terrible. I mean, there were certainly levels where uh, they made you double back, but... Um, well, the reason... Yeah, the, uh, go on. Well, the reason why it's offensive is that because <laughs> it happens so little anymore yeah. in in modern video games. Well, I, th- I think my problem with the backtracking, I think the reason that they, the backtracking doesn't become to be as annoying as it could be is because of the aesthetic. And because it is set up as um, the whole thing is designed like you are moving through an exhibit or a museum. So when you're then moving through it again, because it is so detailed, you're right. then noticing new stuff, right? So I think aesthetically it keeps you interested. But I think as far as the gameplay is concerned, once it gets to a certain point, it, what it then emphasises is the fact that it doesn't, because of the way that the tougher enemy types are designed, it emphasises the fact that they're mainly there for the aesthetic and 
aren't there for the gameplay. So when you go through an area and you fight um, a certain sort of tough enemies that are there because they're within a certain group, and as you're going through, you see these uh, patriots stuck on the wall. Then you come back and you see the patriots again. When that's happened for the fifth time, I think you then start to feel, well, the whole pacing of the game and the whole design of the game is based around the aesthetic and not the gameplay. Certainly, uh, you know, with Ken Levine's, you know, skill set, yeah. that is to be understood. Yeah. Um, you know, he's obviously more about telling a story in a visual style than he is about gameplay, yeah. you know, like, as opposed to the Metro guys. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that is to be expected. Yeah, I, I don't mean to say it is a huge annoyance, as I never really felt like the game was dragging too much except at the end, but it just emphasises what is there present in uh, Bioshock. But in Bioshock, it's hidden and harder to notice, even though it actually more anno- the gameplay is more annoying because there's only one enemy, but they they cover it up better in Bioshock, if you know what I mean. And another thing that was just bizarre that I have to mention is the audio logs. Now, in Bioshock and in Bioshock 2, there is a very flimsy, but there is a reason for having the audio logs there. This is a society that is crumbling and has gone down the shitter, so everyone's recording their final thoughts for the sake of posterity, and they're left lying around because everyone's dead or a psychotic drug addict. There's no fucking reason for, in a perfectly functioning society, there to be these record players loot everywhere within the world, right? And they never attempt to explain it. There's no reason for this to be even be the case, either aesthetically or literally within the narrative. Yeah, the only reason these kinds of things exist anymore is to extend the narrative of the game. Um, basically, here's all the stuff that we couldn't tell you through <laughs> exposition, so you know, either read it or listen to it. Um, but in either case, I think audio logs and, and these kinds of collectibles have outlived their usefulness. Um, even games that perform on the highest level, like Last of Us, include them to their detriment. Yeah, I think you. I think it only works in certain settings and within the right narrative context. So I thought they worked very well in Bioshock, but in Bioshock, they make sense within the world. And it's not just that they make sense in the world, they beca- they are presented as part of the storytelling that is completely separate to the game. But in Infinite, the storytelling is told entirely within the game. As you're walking along, you're constantly talking to Elizabeth and you're constantly coming right. across stuff happening within the world. Right? So there's no reason to have something that is separate from the game world when you're telling the story within the game world itself. So it then just becomes jarring and stupid, especially when you don't even attempt to explain it with some stupid excuse to have it there. And speaking of Elizabeth, the one last thing I wanted to mention was, what did you think of uh, her giving you stuff mid-battle? That, to me, seemed not only rather pointless, but incredibly disorientating because you had to grab whatever she was throwing at you almost as soon as she threw it at you and what happens when when she throws it at you you turn to her so you're shooting this enemy or these several enemies and you might be getting killed and because they've designed it that what happens when you get killed you get a health pack thrown to you so it's in the design that you have to grab the item but this means that you then get disorientated because you're suddenly snapping to where Elizabeth is. To me, that made combat confusing at times, and it seemed to go against gameplay and didn't add anything to her character development whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously included because you wanted this dependence on this character, uh, but it did not add to gameplay whatsoever. Um, yeah, it, it was a drag on the game itself, as opposed to being any sort of benefit. Yeah, uh, to me... Because if... It, I mean, if you think about it from a story level, if she's able to dispense health at any given time or ammo at any given time, yeah. then why do you ever run out of ammo or health, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think 
it was it's completely unnecessary as well because she's constantly throwing you coins, so you still feel like she's helping you. And there are the tears. You can get her to open a tear for a tarot and whatnot. I don't think there was any reason to also include that because you already got all these other things for the sake of character development that this was just completely unnecessary. And the other thing that I thought didn't work particularly well in the combat was the way that the resurrection was handled. I thought it was okay in the original Bioshock, and the reason that it didn't work here is you don't know where you're going to be respawning. So as you get killed, you respawn in a certain spot. There's generally um, a couple in a level, but before it happens, you don't know where it's going to happen, whereas in Bioshock, you could see where the Vita chambers were, which is once again a confusing and disorientating thing. And... Okay, I can live with that when you're then randomly stepping through a doorway and coming out into the world from a narrative perspective. But when she's resuscitating you, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Why aren't the people still shooting at you when she's resuscitating you? Yeah. Why? Yeah. You can and, and... When she's fucking giving you, pumping your heart, you can literally see enemies in the background wandering around aimlessly and it takes forever too i mean her resuscitating yeah, it, it takes, it takes forever. forever and that in bioshock you just respawn instantly so you instantly back into the action here you've got to sit through a cutscene, or you've got to open a door it's just annoying yeah I, I i have no idea why they did this um i mean it almost rose to the level of too human in, in terms of the amount of time that it took. It's like, okay, I get that you're penalizing us for dying, but does it really have to be this long? Exactly, yeah. And so that all sounded um, extremely negative, right? But despite my criticism of the aesthetic, it is an incredibly good-looking game. Um, and the music is also quite enjoyable, but once again incredibly banal as a pastiche. Um, but I, I did enjoy it. I cannot say that I did not enjoy the game. And the reason for that is, one, it looks absolutely incredible, and I'm not going to pretend that I am not a graphics whore. If a game looks good, I am going to enjoy it. I'm not going to pretend that that is not the case. And I also enjoyed the art style as well. The Japanese sex dolls look bizarre, but in a charming sort of way. Um, the religious motifs, uh, once again, were a pretty poor job of pastiching, but they looked extremely good in and of themselves. Um, and technically, I don't think it, this was technically an impressive game. And I saw an article um, saying, what do you need the next generation for when you've got Bioshock Infinite because of how technically advanced it is? Wow. That's bullshit. I was running this game for most of the time, probably 60 frames per second, and that's not because it was well-optimized, because it was not well-optimized. There were lots of times where the frame rate was dropping when it should not have been, and there's lots of... There's so many visual tricks. There's these gorgeous neon lights on top of buildings, right? Move to the side. They disappear. They're two-dimensional sprites. There's two-dimensional sprite smoke as well. It looks amazing, but it, but it is not technically advanced whatsoever in any way or form. But it looks incredible. And despite my criticism, I thought the gameplay was vastly ahead of Bioshock. It was incomparably superior to the original Bioshock. And apart from the pacing issues and that there were no enemies that were on the level of the big sisters, I thought because of the consistency, I would put the, the gameplay just above Bioshock 2 as well, just because it, you're consistently... I was consistently enjoying myself more than I was in Bioshock 2, which had a lot of areas, and especially at the beginning, that just dragged forever. So with all that said... What's your prediction for the score? Are you sticking with a 5.5? Yeah. Okay. I Actually, I think you're going to give it a 6. Okay. So we've got a 7 and a 6 predicted. And remember, you got Bioshock 2, the score, correct. And I'm afraid to say this time you are incorrect. And our good friend Ryan 
of the Brewcast podcast is correct, and I am shockingly giving it a 7 out of 10. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I gave this game a 5 out of 10. Yeah. And I can so, completely understand that 100%. I thought this game was uh, complete generic garbage and had nothing to offer on any level at all. Yeah, and I, I can understand that completely. I, I do think, though, that the plasmids did um, alter the combat enough to make it not so generic. You used the plasmids almost... Um, completely right because you couldn't aim with the PS3 controller. No, I, I used them as grenades. Okay, so um, you only used them as grenades. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and then I used the you know the shooting basically the sniper rifle, the shotgun, okay. and yeah. the uh, automatic yeah. If rifle. you played it like that, this would be a horrible experience. It, and I, I, I'm not de- I'm that's not to defend the game at all. It's a game that encourages experiment and uh, experimentability and encourages you to play as you want, so if one of the ways to play the game is shit, that is the fault of the game, but if you play it um, as a completely over-the-top shooter where you are using both plasmids and um, shooting, I think it becomes a very enjoyable and, to a degree, original experience, which is, once again, not to defend or discount your experience, but yeah, if you were playing it like that, there would be little redeeming about it, except that it looks incredible. Okay, so your final score is? A7. And combined with your 5, shall we give it an out of 20 score? That would be a 12 out of 20. There we go. And I think that's fair. I'm happy with that. I'm completely happy with that. And I'd like to thank you for lowering the score after my 7. Yeah, I, I, had, to, uh, I had to be the, uh, the Tom Towers of, of, of our average here. Otherwise, uh, we would have given this game a, an outlandish score. That's right, yeah. Um, so you're happy with this score? Are you happy with this uh, being our our episode 16? No, I'm not, because we are, in fact, going to talk um, a little about the legacy of Bioshock first. Um, and it is very short. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was feminism. Now, you're no doubt going to say that Elizabeth is a misogynistic character. Um, I think she's just a character. I don't think she demeans... Uh, you know, females in any way. Uh, I don't think she empowers them in any way. I think she's just a regular video game character. Yep, and with I no agree. no plus or minus, just just an average character. Agreed. But there is a strong uh, line of feminism throughout all three Bioshock titles, and I want to see if you can guess what I'm talking about. Well, in the first one, the little sisters are the ones that have the power. Um, I didn't play the second one, and then in the third game, basically Elizabeth is the god, so, yeah. Nope, I'm not referring to that whatsoever. Um, I'm, in fact, referring to the fact that in every single Bioshock game, you can shoot women, and women can kill you. And to me, that is a much more feministic thing to do for the simple fact that there you were dealing with a sexist taboo that is, of course, actually against women, because what does that mean? That means women get less roles in television and film. You can't have as many women extras in an action film or as many women stunt doubles, right, or as many women stunt women. Um, so here's Bioshock, where you've got women involved as grunts and enemies directly involved in the combat, if this was a film, this would actually have a practical effect on the amount of women that could be involved with the project, as opposed to if you're making some empowering female feminist character. So I have to give them credit for that. If I was giving things credit for being feminist, which I'm not, but I'm giving the credit for the fact that you can kill women because I personally enjoy killing women. And I think... Killing women in first-person shooters is something that is lacking because it adds variety to the people you're killing. Right. Underscores my point, which was that Elizabeth was no... was genderless, essentially. Uh, It did not matter whether she was male or female. Um, And and in that case, it was empowering. Yeah. And if you are to take feminism um, as it should be or as meant to be, which is 
asking for equal rights, the only feminist character, correct feminist character, is of course one that is genderless. Because if you are then deliberately empowering a female character, it ceases to be feminist because it is sexist, a sexist depiction. Correct. Yeah. So kudos both for a genderless character and also for allowing us to shoot women, which is still a bizarre taboo that persists in video games and, once again, adds aesthetically to first-person shooters. Okay, now, the other thing in regards to the legacy of Bioshock that I want to talk about, and I need your input on this, in Gears of War, there are apparently sequences during the loading where the characters are walking along and talking to one another. Right. Right? Um, in Bioshock... Uh, both in the original and in Infinite and in 2, but especially in Infinite and the original, there are instances of what has now been referred to as cinematic walking, where you're walking through a setting and the narrative is unfolding around you, basically in the vein of Half-Life storytelling. Um, and the best moment of the generation, almost well-known mo- moment, is in the original where you crash land and you go down into the into Rapture, Right? That's one of the most famous moments of cinematic walking storytelling in gaming. And to me, Bioshock's greatest influence has been on many, many games copying this. I I say this was more influential than Half-Life because Half-Life did it first, but to me, Bioshock popularized it and inspired many games to copy it because it's they're not copying it. Most games don't copy it in the Half-Life style, where you're just in a cut scene and you're sitting around and the characters are talking to you. Most games are now copying it where you're walking through a setting and the narrative moves along with you, right? So, to me, that is probably Bioshock's most influential point. But I was wondering if perhaps Gears of War um, has some claim to fame here as well. What, what, with the slow walking? Yeah, with the slow walking where the story is where the story folds around you as you move through the physical setting of the game. No, no, it was not the same as as to this. In Gears of War, it's no more than just allowing the next level to load. Um, and you can see this in Space Marine uh, as well. Uh, basically, they'll slow you down where they need to because in the background they're loading up the next level. Okay, yeah. So uh, that's more... never never used as a narrative device. Okay, okay. So that is Bioshock. Okay. Yep. And nevertheless, I'm going to blame Susan O'Connor for this, who wrote Gears of War as well as Bioshock. So I'm going to pretend that Gears of War was the same and blame her for the scourge of modern gaming, which is cinematic walking. And that's pretty much it for Legacy. Um, now... I just wanted to go back to Infinite for a second and go into spoiler territory for a minute. Now, you didn't play Bioshock 2, but both Bioshock 1, 2, and 3 have all finished in exactly the same way. Um, Actually, I can't... What happened in the end, the bad ending of uh, Bioshock, I think he harvested the little sisters, right? I'm sorry, I don't quite remember the story element of it i remember the okay, gameplay well, I think, of it i think what happened was completely underwhelming but yeah you're right something yeah. happened with the little sisters yeah yeah well the, there was g- gathering of little sisters and uh the main character ha- harvesting the good ending in the bad ending they all harvested uh andrew ryan in bioshock 2 depending on the ending you got it ends once again with a large collection of little sisters lingering around just as it did in Bioshock 1, and look at Infinite. What's the ending? A large collection of Elizabeths standing around in exactly the same way. What the hell is going on with Ken Levine? The only thing I can possibly imagine is, do you know anything about his personal life? No. Because I know that he was born in Flushing and that he is an atheist, okay. according to his Wikipedia entry. Okay, because I want, does he have like, a collection of obnoxious daughters, or does he have a large amount of sons and has always wanted a daughter and been unable to find one? Because this is a hilarious recurring motif that is stuck in there. And also the this whole father-daughter relationship, which was done so much better in Bioshock 2 than in Infinite or 1, 
once again, is in, present in every single damn Bioshock game. So uh, what the hell is going on with this man? This is some fascinating bizarre motif to have in your game. And <clears throat> speaking of uh, the ending of the game, the whole metaphysics thing to me was so incredibly disappointing with what they did with the ending, especially the Bioshock section. Um, at one stage, you're walking through Rapture, and this has been met with extreme fan uh, giggling, uh, fan praise, right? Are you familiar with this phenomenon? No. Okay, well, you remember the section where you walk through Rapture? No. Did you finish the game? Which one? Bioshock Infinite. Infinite. Yes. Yeah. At the end. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end, you go to the thing, lighthouse, and you're in this place, and it's underwater. Yes, <clears throat> I remember. Yeah. That. It, it lasted about three minutes. Yeah, and what the hell was that? That seemed like the entire reason for the metaphysics bullshit was just so that they could have you move through an incredibly vulgar pandering to the fans of sticking you in rapture, which added nothing whatsoever to the themes or the story to me, or to even um, bringing home that this is in the same world as Bioshock. You don't need to do this. It's the same themes as Bioshock. It's the same story um, conflict as in Bioshock. You don't need to then stick in an incredibly stupid section that is just so incredibly obvious and base. That, to me, came across as not good fan service whatsoever, but everyone loved it, apart from me. What, really? Yeah. What did you think of it? I thought it was <clears throat> ludicrously tacked on. Exactly. exactly. I mean, it, it was basically like, hey, we called this game Bioshock, and here's why. You know, in, in the last few seconds of this game, let's just say this was a Bioshock game. See? Rapture, yeah. huh? Huh? Just for the people with IQs under 30 to go, oh, okay, I get it. It's a Bioshock game. Yeah. <laughs> Which is I thought it, most I of thought our it listenership. Was, I thought it was absolutely unnecessary and insulting. Yeah, absolutely. And, just, my God, what the hell was that? Um, and I, I want to go back to um, just one other thing that had nothing to do with the ending, and that was the... Wounded Knee section, which was quite controversial. And this, to me, ties in perfectly to Ken Levine's incredibly obnoxious marketing persona. Even though I praised it for actually being relevant to certain conventions of the era, and I stand by that. But this is basically what the, he did with the politics of Bioshock, which was you take um, some something that everyone thinks is shit, like objectivism, everyone hates objectivism, but at the same time, everyone has some knowledge of it because everyone hates it so much. And it's a reasonably recent uh, philosophical standpoint, but no one knows anything about objectivism. No one knows what the fuck objectivism is, except that it was written by some woman who is a psychopath, right? That's, that's the extent of everyone's knowledge of objectivism. This then allows you to make something that is completely shallow, that is basically name-dropping objectivism and not going beyond that, yet centering marketing around what is a uh, big thing in the gaming world. They've done exactly the same thing here with metaphysics. They've taken something that everyone knows about. Metaphysics is cool now. Everyone's heard metaphysics. No one knows anything about it. metaphysics. The point of metaphysics is no one knows anything about it. So you can take metaphysics in exactly the same way that Inception did the same thing. You can create a story based around metaphysics that has nothing to do with metaphysics and market as metaphysics, and it's going to get praise for being metaphysics when it has absolutely nothing to do with metaphysics. It is an incredibly shallow and stupid the most shallow possible way you could depict metaphysics while still calling metaphysics and still get praise for it. To me, just as the politics was in Bioshock, this is the most cynical and obnoxious and blatant marketing um, 
marketing ideal stuck in your game. It's like including Pepsi, right? It's like including Pepsi cans everywhere to me. That's how ridiculous it is. No comments at all on that. No, I think, I mean... No, no comments needed. So I, I, that's what I was wondering. Is that is that a reasonable statement, or do you agree or disagree with that? I I agree entirely with what you said yeah. there. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that uh, Bioshock Two did far better as well. Is they didn't select uh, any political philosophy. They selected a political concept. They completely misunderstood it, but they actually attempted to develop it into something. And it's been criticised, as far as I can see, has been criticised for its depiction of the, the philosophical concepts involved. But un, the only reason it's been criticised is because they didn't carefully pick pick what you could take and make into uh, being something that's completely shallow and stupid. They took something that people have some knowledge of, they attempted to develop it, so that it was an actual thing that people could latch on to and look at and say, okay, this is really incredibly stupid, which it was. But they deserve so much more credit for having the courage of including a political tract within a video game in a way that Bioshock claimed it did and in a way that Bioshock Infinite claims it does with metaphysics. Neither of those games do that. So after playing all three... If it wasn't for the aesthetic of one, I have to say two would actually be my favourite, and I've scored at the lowest. But that's just how my scoring works. So, Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, like, most people, I think, would have played the first and the third, I mean, and then skipped the second. Yeah. Um, would, at this point, given the amount of games that are out there, given the amount of time that I have, would it be worth going back to play the second game? I think um, if you hate Bioshock, it might not be because there's still some really annoying things from Bioshock in that game. But I think as a standalone first-person shooter, not only is it a very solid first-person shooter that does some interesting things, I think it does actually do some narrative things that are very uh, worthwhile and interesting. And it does things that Bioshock claims to do but did not do Um in any way, shape, or form. And it also does stuff that Bioshock did, such as the uh, redemption theme that goes along in Bioshock, the original and infinite, and is handled well in the original game, not so well in infinite, and it does it as well as those games, but it does it in a more accessible manner because it does it in a direct uh, involvement with the protagonist and the characters in the game, and the character's that are involved in the redemption are directly uh, living their redemption out through the characters in the game. So I think if you couldn't get into some of the things that were good about Bioshock because they did it in such a divergent way, Bioshock 2 is actually possibly a good way to experience them if you can get past some of the generic elements and some of the annoying elements of the original Bioshock because they do it in a more accessible and in some ways successful so, uh, successful manner. I, I'm really on the fence as to whether or not I should play Bioshock 2, but I'm pretty sure that I will have to give it a give it a buy because it is kind of silly to have the first and third and not the not the middle game, uh, particularly when it's made by a different studio. I think from a video game education point of view, it's probably a must buy. You need to play it I, because I want to hear what you think of that game, and I think once you get past the beginning of that game and it successfully develops its own personality and structure, I think you will probably enjoy that much more than either the original or Infinite. 